Well, the International Monetary Fund is predicting 2020 will be the worst year since the Great Depression, forecasting that global GDP will drop by 3% this year. Joining me now in Sydney is the Australian's economics editor, Adam Crichton, and the founder of the investment newsletter, The Switzer Report, Peter Switzer, joining me via Skype. Well, I can't say that the IMF is always top of the pops with me or that they get it always right, Adam. What did you make of the latest report and predictions of doom and gloom? Well, look, certainly you are right, Peter. The forecasts of the IMF are just as uh, faulty as other forecasts and they've been proven wrong many times. But that said, uh, it does seem pretty likely that there's going to be an extraordinary contraction this year. And, and even on an optimistic scenario, the IMF said about $9 trillion, $9 trillion US dollars of economic output would be lost over the next few months as advanced economies uh, shrink by about 6% this year. Uh, that is extraordinary. I thought it was particularly interesting to look at the uh, total of government of new government spending around the world to combat uh, this downturn. So, uh, so advanced governments are spending 3.3 trillion US dollars extra, and they're going to send guaranteed loans to the tune of uh, 4.5 trillion on top of that. So this is a truly extraordinary expansion of uh, fiscal size of government. And look, it remains to be seen, you know, how it's all going to turn out. I mean, uh, it's clearly not possible for governments all at once to borrow all that money. So the reality is the various central banks will be creating the money out of thin air and they'll be funding the deficits that way. Now, most economists are confident that that, that won't cause an outbreak of inflation, but who knows down the track. Peter Switzer, they called it the Great Depression way back when. They're now calling this the Great Lockdown. They're talking, as, as Adam just said, about $9 trillion. I hope we never get to a situation where we throw the trillions around as easily as we've suddenly started throwing the billions around. We've all get comfortable with a billion term. I remember when I started in politics 20 years ago, you hardly ever talked about billions. Now, if you think it's in million terms, you think we're shortchanging people. How did you see the report? Well, one thing I will say is that over time, we'll actually see a television program called Trillions rather than Billions. Um, <laughs> and, and when it comes to the IMF, I totally agree with Adam. You know, to, for them to come out with this kind of uh, prediction, you, you're not sure whether they're going to be right. It's a hard thing to predict because we don't know how long the containment cost policies, the policies, containment policies, and the cost that it's, it's, it's imposing on the economies worldwide, we don't know how long it will last. But the one thing I think was really important to emphasise was this: the idea that they're believing there'll be a, a V-shaped recovery. So in Australia's yeah. case, we're down 6.7%, but rebounding 6.1% in uh, 2021. And I interviewed a guy called Michael Knox, the chief economist at Morgan's, and he reckons that uh, the, the Fed has actually studied a lot of... Um, uh, uh, the Spanish flu implications on various economies and various various big cities in the USA, and the ones that actually had the the, the hardest containment policies actually grew the fastest in the ensuing years. And he's actually predicting Australia will will move into like a 21st century roaring 20s after all of this because of the stimulus that Adam was talking about is going to be so big we could actually, you know, in a sense, see a roaring 20s reproduced for the 21st century. And, and Peter, presumably he's also talking about that V-shaped recovery and cross-referencing the Feds with what happened in the Spanish flu. And I think on, on this program I've shown some graphs of uh, Illinois, I think it was, and uh, Philadelphia, two very different responses to the Spanish flu, and it determined actually how quickly they recovered. Uh, around the world they're all saying what Australia has done and not just flatten the curve but now turning it downwards has been quite remarkable. So are mm. you saying that that's going to be in part what leads, hopefully, fingers crossed. Yes, we'll have the hit, but the V-shaped recovery will be strong because of that. Yeah, that's our best guess. You know, we, we really don't know. It's fantastic that we're, we're seeing this kind of great flattening of the curve uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and, and I think the next, probably the next four to, to five weeks is going to be critically important. And if we do it really well, you know, we may well get out of jail a lot quicker than other economies, and we might be rebounding stronger than other economies as well. That's my fingers crossed uh, uh, scenario for the future. Yeah, it's all a bit like, you know, astrology, I have to say, some of these forecasts. <laughs> right. and, you know, I'm a bit sceptical. I've, I've seen all the sunshine before and got the rain. But um, on the issue of the UK and the US, Adam, uh, what's the IMF saying for them? What can we look like? What can we look to overseas as some sort of indicator? Mm. 
Well, the problem with the US and the UK is, of course, those governments uh, start the situation with far, far more government debt than Australia does. And actually, it's, you know, it's worth pointing out that the IMF did tally up all of the fiscal responses of all the governments around the world. And the Australian governments was the largest by far. And it is worth stressing that that's, that's you know, partly uh, because of the relative fiscal prudence of Australian governments over the years that they've been able to do that. Um, I was just actually uh, just talking to the former governor of the Bank of England uh, literally half an hour ago, Mervyn King, and he was he's concerned that the uh, the longer the lockdown is in place in the UK, the more damaged uh, that economy will be. And he was essentially suggesting that you know governments really need to take the lead soon on the debate, the very very uncomfortable and difficult debate, uh, which I think actually some countries on the continent are already starting to have that they will have to reopen their economies. Uh, because the vaccine is is you know, realistically a long way away and we can't be locked down until a vaccine emerges. And so there's going to be some very difficult decisions. But, you know, I think you would say, you know, kind of sharing some of the uh, some of the optimism of Peter, I think I think our economy will come out of this a lot better than some of those European economies. Yeah, and I think that comes down to the primary inputs we've got. You know, people need to eat. Obviously, Australia is a good source for food and fibre and, uh, and other consumables like that. But also, if you want to get your factories going, you're going to need energy uh, and you've got to go minerals and iron ore and things like that. So for all the, the rubbish that gets thrown at our sort of low value uh, economy or mm. offerings in an export sense, they're what uh, save our bacon time and time again. Peter Switzer, I've got to ask you, there's this whole debate going on. We know that there's some deal in the offing on, on uh, Virgin and Qantas to and maintain some domestic routes that's separate to the broader discussion about whether or not Virgin will survive this uh, shutdown period in the crisis indeed and whether or not, more broadly, it should be bailed out by the taxpayers or what the bailout might be. It could be an equity stake, it could be other things. Where is it all sitting and, and what's your view? Well, I think the, the most important thing is we, we do need to maintain two airlines uh, for the competitive nature of what happens when you've got two, when you've got one, it would be, be a terrible monopoly. And we're seeing consumers have really benefited uh, over the last you know, seven to eight years in particular. We've seen the discounting in, in airfares and we've seen you know, the competition being a benefit to consumers. And I think the bottom line is the, the government should be interested in lending money to the airlines if they need it, like as a cash flow or overdraft because they are critically important to the economy. You know, tourism and, and the travel related with business and education, all that sort of stuff is very important to the, the balance of payments as well. And I think it's a really important industry to, to uh, assist during these troubled times. And remember, ultimately, this was a government-created crash for, for good, humane medical reasons. And these guys are the, are the, the sort of the collateral damage. And I've got to say, you know, uh, they could even look about look at maybe changing the, the current quarantine rules. I actually wanted to go to Melbourne. I rang up Virgin to see whether they actually had any flights before Easter. And they said, yeah, you, have, you can fly to Melbourne, but you'll have to take, do 14 days quarantine in Melbourne. When you come back, 14 days quarantine in Sydney. So it was pointless to go away. But I think we need to look at those sorts of you know, impositions or obstacles to these you know, two airlines, which are, I think, two very good airlines doing well. Adam, just quickly from you. Yeah, look, just, just on that issue, I do agree with Peter, we need a competitive industry, but I think it's worth taking a step back and actually reflecting that, you know, the very structure of the airline industry is going to be completely different, I think, going forward. I, I mean, surely it's unrealistic to assume that we're going to have, for, you know, four, five, maybe 10 years, the same volume of global travel. So there's going to have to be a consolidation you know, we might even see sort of permanent government support for particular routes, a kind of ongoing subsidies. I mean, in a worst case scenario, you know, you'll, you'll kind of have quasi government owned airlines around the world, not, not necessarily here. But uh, if the demand is not there, then private companies are just, you know, simply not going to switch on these very expensive planes uh, kind of without some form of subsidy. So, you know, it is worth kind of thinking about the long term structure.